hundreds of labs around the world study aging. And one of the, the latest ideas is that aging might not just be slowable, but actually reversible. And this is something that I thought I'd never uh, see in my lifetime. Now, the reason that I think it's quite remarkable to even talk about reversing aging is that just 20 years ago, the idea of even having an impact on aging uh, with genetic changes or small molecules, drugs, was considered crazy. Uh, I got into this field about 20 years ago when I was a kid, and a lot of people advised me not to go into aging. It's bad science. It's the backwater of biology. And uh, I just thought it was a really interesting thing to study and that it could have a really big impact on the world if, it, if we could do something about aging. I'm doing this not so I can make people or see people live a thousand years. I don't think that that's going to happen anytime soon. But what I'm doing this for is to be able to have a big impact on human health. So what about reversing aging? Now, one of the reasons that we've uh, su been surprised that aging is so reversible, at least in simple organisms, is that an, a leading dogma in the theory of aging, why we age, is the mutation theory of aging. And that's the idea that our bodies accumulate mutations over time and that that leads to the decline in our body's function. And as you may well know, mutations are largely irreversible. Now the good news is that maybe it's not the mutations themselves that cause aging, but the cell's overreaction to the DNA damage that occurs as we live. When I was just a young postdoc studying aging in a simple organism, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is the technical term for baker's yeast. Now these are little yeast cells that the world uses to make bread and beer, champagne, for example. And this organism is really interesting and useful because you can change its genes very easily. You can study its lifespan within a week. They only live about a week. They produce about 25 offspring and then they die. And the, the first thing that I wanted to study when I was doing my postdoctoral research at MIT in the lab of Lenny Garenti was why do these cells not live forever? They're relatively simple. They just divide, they split. So why couldn't these be like stem cells? Why couldn't they? live forever. Well, it turns out that the problem with these cells, the main problem, is that their DNA becomes unstable. And what happens is on the, the linear chromosome, they have 16 chromosomes in a haploid cell, the chromosomes pinch off a circle of DNA and these replicate and they end up choking this single mother cell. Normally what, if, if a cell was smart, it would divide that, cir split that circle between the, the mother and the daughter cell, and you just have a circle between the mother and the daughter, and that would be no big deal. But the problem is that the cells don't know how or don't efficiently put this circle into the offspring. They accumulate it, they keep it in the cell, and the cell thinks this little circle of DNA is another chromosome, so it, it replicates that, and you get exponential growth of this circle. And actually within a number of divisions, about 13, 12, 13 divisions, you end up with so many circles of DNA in the thousands that they outnumber the rest of the chromosomes in that cell. And they, they choke the cell. They titrate, they suck away the proteins and the cell can't divide and they die. And we were able to show in that lab that if you delay the circles from forming or you prevent them from replicating efficiently, the cells can actually live longer and we could extend lifespan in that organism. And that was one of the first known causes of aging and for one of the first ways to slow down that known cause. Somewhat disappointing was that when we looked for these circles of DNA in our own cells, in mammals, we didn't find many of them. And in fact, we don't think that these circles themselves are the key to immortality in, in mammals or in ourselves. But uh, what we do think is that there's a principle there that tells us about aging in our bodies, and that leads us to this reversibility of aging. So what we then discovered when we were studying this circle formation was that there were these proteins that tried to suppress the genome instability. There are proteins in our cells as well that go to DNA regions of instability, where, for example, there's a break in the chromosomes or the DNA is highly repetitive, 
that try to stabilize our DNA. And that's true for yeast cells as well. Now, one of these proteins turns out to be really important for this process, and its name is SIR2, S-I-R-2. Now, in our bodies, we have seven of these SIR2 genes. We call them the sir 2 ins And we think they play a very similar role in humans as they do in yeast. That's maintaining the stability of the chromosomes that are apt to recombine and form breaks and, and circles. Well, one of the most amazing things we discovered was that these proteins that are normally bound at the ends of chromosomes, the telomeres, which many people will know are, is a one cause of aging, the loss of these repeats. They're bound at various regions of the chromosome and they control whether genes are turned on or off. So proteins in yeast are very good and their main purpose is to keep genes switched off that should not be coming on unless the cell is stressed. Now what the problem is, is that when you get this genome instability in the broken DNA and the circles, the so proteins are, have this trigger that the cell says, hey, I know you're busy over here silencing, controlling these genes over here, but we need you really now for this genome instability. These circles are popping out, the chromosomes are breaking, get over here. So they, the cell recruits them in a very active mechanism, pulls them to the region of pro where there's a problem, and the SIR proteins help repair the DNA. They, they bind to it, they, they um, make it fold up correctly, and this, the DNA break is repaired more efficiently. The problem though, is that if they don't go back to where they came from, these genes that were once silenced and controlled by the SIR proteins are now expressed. They come on, you get a stress response, which is okay in the short term, but in the long run, you end up with a cell that has a permanent chronic stress response, which is not good for a yeast cell, and it's not good for a human being either. And in fact, we now know that chronic stress is a major cause of aging in many different organisms from yeast to humans. So really what I'm saying in essence is, in yeast we learned that DNA damage, DNA instability, chromosomes breaking, uh, distracts these proteins from what they should be doing, which is controlling how genes are expressed. During the distraction, these genes come on and the cell has this stress response. Now in yeast, what happens is, uh, one example is that SIR proteins normally uh, silence genes that control uh, mating. Yeast cells mate, they need to find uh, the opposite sex. And SIR proteins tell the cell uh, which, by suppressing certain genes, whether it's a, a male or a female, A or an alpha cell. When the SIR proteins are distracted, repairing, helping repair DNA, you get these sex genes coming on and the cell doesn't know if it's male or female, A or an alpha, and it actually becomes very confused and it can no longer mate. It becomes sterile or sterile. And that's a hallmark of yeast aging, is sterility. And what we found was that if we could prevent this genome instability or actually put more SIR genes into the cell, we can put in more genes quite easily, we could do two really important things. One was you could repair the chromosomes better because there's more so proteins to go around. And these silent genes, these mating type genes that cause sterility stayed silent and the cells didn't become sterile until much later. We think that the same process occurs in our own cells as we age. What we and others have found is that we do develop breaks and chromosome instability during aging, particularly at repeated DNA. So when there's one gene after another like this, or not just genes, just repeats, the chromosomes are very apt to crossing over, as we call it, recombining, breaking. And when this happens, the SIR proteins in our bodies, they, they move to the break, and we know that they help repair. SIR proteins in our bodies also control which genes are turned on or off. And we think that when there's bro breaks in our own chromosomes, that these SIR proteins are moving away from where they should be. And one of the tests of that was to, to see if we create DNA breaks in our cells, in, in culture. Do the SIR proteins move to the breaks? Yes, they do. And do these genes that are normally controlled by SIR proteins get expressed? Yes, they do. And another interesting thing was that the genes that come on when you have breaks were very similar had an overlap with the genes that come on during aging in, an, in a mouse. 
and we think that this may be also true for our bodies as well. So what's this got to do with the reversibility of aging? Well, if it's true that it's not the mutations and the breaks in the DNA that cause aging, but the cell's reaction to that, what we should be able to do is to compensate for that reaction. One thing we could do would be to put in more so genes, and so the genes make more so proteins. So instead of having them all distracted, we could have enough proteins to go around so we could control those genes and have the repair process go on at the same time and keep those genes silenced when they should. The second thing we could do is to make these proteins have more activity. We now know that if we put in simple molecules, maybe a drug one day, we could make these proteins hyperactive so they can do their job at the broken DNA and they could also keep the genes controlled. Without these molecules, what happens in our bodies, we think, is that over time, these genes come on and we're left with a chronic stress response. And this stress response leads to the decline of our bodies and aging. So really, what does this mean? Just to sum up, is that if it's not the mutations and it's the actual, the changes in proteins, how they move around the cell, this should be reversible. And we're already seeing signs from work that we and others are doing that we can restore uh, the function of these proteins and not just delay aging, but reverse it as well. This is a, leading to a whole new field called epigenetics, where we can change how the chromosomes are read, how the chromosomes are wrapped up in the cell, and take that back to a more youthful state. And if we can succeed in doing that, we have a great chance of being able to not just delay aging, uh, but put it off and even possibly reverse it one day so that we can lead much healthier and longer lives.